All right. I'm here with Vinci Ill. This is Al Prophet. And um, this is a gentleman whose YouTube channel I came across uh, maybe about two months ago. He's a Detroit guy like me, and he has, a, he has I guess, at this point be described as a prison channel, of which a genre I don't think either one of us would have ever thought would be such a big popular thing. It's kind of kind of shocking. But um, he has a really good channel. It's a lot, to me, much more, well, the other ones are interesting. I don't know. It, but I find it to be a, a good channel and is definitely shedding some light on different conditions and different uh, Department of Corrections. Most of the stuff we see is almost all from California or Florida, and it gives you a real skewed um, perspective of what things are like. But it also shows how different America is in different places. Like uh, I had to do a year in Arizona, and you know, and I got it. When they told me there was a head of the whites and the blacks, I thought they were playing a practical joke on me. I was like, "There's no such thing as that," and uh, and you can't sit here and all that. <clears throat> so, but so what's what's your uh, what? How can they find your channel? And I'll put a link, of course. Yes, sir. Um, first, thanks for having me, man. It's a big deal to be on here with you. But uh, yeah, well, you did the, you did the hard work. You're doing interesting stuff. I appreciate it, definitely, definitely. Well, my YouTube channel is Petty P T T Y underscore Vinci V I N N C I E L. I know a lot of people say L, but we pronounce it Eel in the uh, more scientific of America. And uh, let me give you a YouTube uh, tip and suggestion: go into your settings and find your vanity name and make it an easy one. Like me, I can tell people go to youtube.com slash Al Profit. So you can set it up so you can go to youtube.com slash Vinci L or whatever you want. Okay. So it's easier. So they don't have to search for it. They can actually go to an address. Very noted. Okay, so take us uh, through your journey. Um, well, I guess let's go back to the beginning. Tell, tell us about... Uh, <laughs> me and my friends from Detroit, you know, uh, we we're watching you we like, oh, we're going to figure out what part of Detroit he's from. <laughs> um, so so tell us, like, where you're from and, uh, you know, what what your life was um, or whatever you want to tell us about leading up to, of course, prison and some of those experiences. And then we'll get into the channel. OK, well, I started off in southwest Detroit with my grandmother. I spent Now, the which part of southwest Detroit? 51st in Michigan. OK. Uh, yeah, I was over there and um the wild area. I used to I used to be on like I used to go to get stuff on Buchanan and like 30th. They used to be so wild over there. Yeah. I bought a gun out of the build or a guy that was in the building where the Malise Green memorial was painted took me to get a gun. Wow. <laughs> Weird. Yeah. Okay, so you're from 51st in Michigan. Originally, yes, but I spent a lot of my years what we call hopping off the porch on the north end of Detroit. Third Street and Pingree. Uh, for me, growing up, it, it'd be a slap in my mother's face if I said I had it bad. But uh, I, I really feel she just didn't not really raise a boy. So, you know, around 13, 14, I started gravitating towards the streets. That's where I felt the real love at and whatnot. And, um, now, what is great? What was your first, uh, I mean, just hanging out or actually doing criminal stuff or older guys getting you to sell drugs or what was getting in the streets mean? Well, I started off just hanging out with the gang members, drug dealers or whatever. And, you know, they liked me. I liked them. So eventually I started a uh, gang bang. I joined uh, Gangster Disciples or known today as growth, is growth and Development. Okay, around. so that was down on 51st in Michigan, of course, right? No, uh -uh. I, I was, I um, dealt with those guys over there. But no, they had a, their own section and branch over there on the uh, second. In the North End? Yep. Oh, see, that's a new, how old are you? 31. Oh, so I'm, yeah, I'm 15 years older than you. So yeah, that, the phenomenon of like gangs in Detroit. Oh, I just, can you see me? Okay. The phenomenon of gangs in Detroit, they always have been in Southwest Detroit, uh, but them being in other neighborhoods, that's, that's in the last, you know, 15, probably 2000 and beyond. So that's interesting. So GDs in the North end and were those guys, were there any, was there Chicago guys? Was there, was it all Detroit people? It was one Chicago guy named Bebe G. That's who brought it over there. It's Bebe G. Real wild, crazy guy. But everybody loved him. I liked him. And we, we spent a lot of time together. So I eventually joined with those guys. What age were you when I you joined? 
But how do I turn? Oh, I'm sorry about that. It, what, what do I push? Not disturb? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, something's ringing. Yeah, put on do not disturb. Yeah, I got it on now. Yeah, do not disturb is on. Um, might have to turn off the bell notification or something. There we go. I turn, yeah, okay. This that should do it because I turned off my um. Okay. Turned off. There you go. My bad about that. Oh, all good. I just chop it out. Hey, this this it's amazing that we can conduct these over like this. So I don't complain about little minor things like that. Okay, Christ. So okay, so you were what age were you when you when you joined the GDs and those Chicago organizations? You don't really get beat in. It's a little different, right? Exactly. Yes, it's way different. Yeah, we don't get jumped in and whatnot. It's about how much literature and creed that we retain. So I was uh going on fourteen years old. And um, in general, I always you know me, I always talk about in general, not nothing in particular, no one in particular, but in general, a lot of the Chicago groups, you know, they're on the spectrum of like a mafia family versus a street gang. They're kind of closer to a mafia uh you know at least the ones i'm aware of and a lot of them are organized for the purpose of criminal activity whereas here in la there's a lot of serious gang members who the only crimes they might commit are about gang banging they might have a regular job right but <laughs> that's less so true would you say with with the chicago groups D definitely, especially in that area, we didn't really have no rivals or nothing like that. So it was more about criminal uh, activities, get the money. And, and and did you start making any money in this, at that age? Were you like getting sacks and keeping twenty five off a hundred type thing? Or they they tried to do that to me, but no, I got into stealing cars. That was my thing. We were stealing cars. Uh, the guy Take him to the chop shop. Oh, yep, yep. He had uh, baby G had a connection on the chop shops, and that's what we was doing. We were just stealing mm. the money. Every night. And this was kind of in an organized manner. Yes. And this was a long time ago, so there ain't no statute of limitation stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And um what was was mom seeing the evidence of you making money? No, she didn't catch that until a couple years later. She had a up when I got into the drugs, she had found the scale of mine and it broke her heart. She just started crying and just didn't know what to do or say to me. I, I was in a doghouse for about two, three weeks. So so mom was not a street person, she was at a job and yeah. Yeah, never nothing. With it's the hard in Detroit. I mean, a lot of parent like it's just criminal activity is so much a part of the economy for everybody. It's just re selling drugs in particular is just like regular. Yeah, it is. It, it, it seemed that way. It become a, nor a normality. Yeah. And what was what drug did you get into selling in the beginning? Crack cocaine right off the bill. Crack cocaine. But did, dealing with crackheads is not fun. I'd rather steal a car. <laughs> hey, look, it's, it was real different. I don't have guys trying to rob me, everything, snatch stuff from me. It's some rough, especially if you're in the North End. It's not like you're getting like suburban or many suburban customers. You're getting rough guys. Exactly. Yeah, guys just came home doing 25 years for murder. You get them yep. type of guys. Yep, and they blaming on the door at 2 a.m. and they, they want some crack and they have no money. In fact. <laughs> and did you have much success in selling drugs? Did you make much money? Not at that time, no. I thought I was making a little something, but no, not at that time. I didn't have no success, really. Were you doing any, were you kind of bouncing between regular jobs and, or this was still high school age? Yeah, this was still middle school, high school, yeah. Oh, middle started, school, yeah, right, okay. 13. And as you got towards 18, were you still in high school? Did you did you graduate? Well, I, I, no, I got a GED, but I ended up going to a, a juvenile detention facility for two years. Two oh, and a half. what was when I was 16. What happened? I had caught a carjacking, an armed robbery, unlawfully driving. Oh. So the car theft pro progressed into carjacking. Yes, it did. And, and, and carjacking is still bad in Detroit. It never died out. Yeah. But that's one of those crimes you can get a lot of time for. You're lucky you were 16 and not 18. Yes, I was. Because when they told me in the courtroom, like, man, this carry life, I almost wanted to faint. They were giving guy when I was getting in trouble in the mid nineties. I mean, they had kid, kids that come in there at 18, they'd have 19 carjacking cases and they get hung 37 years, you know? 
I and then you. if you shoot somebody while you're doing it, or your boy messes with the woman, now it's a rape. A guy I went to high, uh, middle school with got 50 years carjacking and rape. I don't know what the story is, but I would imagine probably was a crew of them, and one guy probably did something, and they you all take the weight. Man, oh, I've seen that so many times too. Yes. So, so you get out when you're 18, and what's what's your game plan then? So I'm trying to be on the righteous path. I get out, get a job. I was just working, working. Had two jobs at one point in time, but when you go back out to the same neighborhood, you start hanging around the same people, you progressively get back into the same thing. So I picked up drugs again, and I had ran with it for a while. Did you did you ever operate on Seward? Yeah, oh, that's, well, we weren't, my side wasn't really allowed on Seward. I was a pangry guy. And okay, because the reason I ask is because yeah. I know you've seen my Doc Davis uh, uh, interviews, right? Right. So his nephews, they were the ones running Seward. We we call that Mini New York. Oh, it, it, oh that was the Carter. Yeah, that that was one of the most when when I was getting my graduate degree at Wayne State, and um and I had a job at Center for Urban Studies, and we would get contracted by the city to do different stuff with st different statistics. And ironically, I ended up I was getting access to Detroit nine one one calls, and we'd have to like map them. And uh, that 50 Seward, 50 Seward, was the number one 911 call address in the whole city of Detroit. Yes, I can believe it. They had to shut that building down for a while. Just, man, it was crazy. It's crazy over there. That, yeah, that, was, I, that, was, I, that was active. Yeah, we didn't go down there. <laughs> so, okay, so that's interesting. So, yeah, and then a guy, one of my good younger friends, when he was about 13, they were selling these from 12th Street. They were selling dummies over there. And the guys, the Seward guys I know put like, not a murder hit, but like a, you know, assault hit on them. And uh, they, they ended up, they caught him and they were like, damn, y'all are like 13 and they let them slide. <laughs> so there was a lot going on. So, so for those who that's to be over there selling drugs was serious. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. You get hurt or worse. There's a chain of command over there for sure. Yeah. And um, so you're 18, you're do you're back into drugs. Did you ever feel like you made any progress as far as getting any real money in that or? It, 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 it was a little better. It wasn't until years later where I had some real success, but it, it, it was enough to stay fresh, just to dump stuff, want to stay fresh, want to go to the club with my homies and buy a bottle of rosé. You know, it was just stupid. And was much, okay, so you're in the GDs, but like there weren't really riot. Was, was that just something you were... Did the gang membership cause any problems? Was there any real gang violence per se? No, not in that area, no. When I when I went back out to Southwest, it was a different thing because I brought what I knew down there and I knew a lot more literature and creed than the guys because I had a real Chicago guy put me on. So it, I had problems down there somewhat, but not really, you know, over there, no, no. And like who was over there? Was that that era? I mean, you know, still the Counts and the Cobras and the, uh, I don't know if Cash Flow Posse was still around. You ever hear of them? Oh, yeah, definitely. Shout out Big Brew, yes. Oh, you yeah. know, yeah, they just got out or one, two of the brothers or one of the brothers got out. And for those not from Detroit, like Southwest, parts of it is the only area where there's like a substantial white population. And that's like the worst gang area in Detroit. So it's the environment. It's not the the people. Like yeah. uh, the, the the white guys in Southwest Detroit are are just as dangerous as anybody else. I mean, it's a it's, small area, but it's a real drug and gang infested area, ironically. So anybody that thinks that, uh, you know, the black people bring the crime, it's the environment puts the crime and whoever gets put in the environment. And that's for sure. I, I, I wish people realized that because that's a culture shock. You go down there with any uh, preconceptions about white people, you, you alarm some real quick. <laughs> yeah, for real. So, so you're 18, 19, 20, drugs, you, you leave the cars alone, right? Or Yeah, I left the cars alone. And then what led to your, your incarceration? I had an incident with my kid's mother, cussed her out real bad. She went to um, tell her- What husband, age were you at this point? I'm, at, I'm 23. Yeah, I'm 23 at the time, about to be 24. So she go tell, she got another um, kid by somebody else. So she go tell him. He bring like four people over there and meet one people at the house I was staying at, right? And um, I guess they thought I was gonna run or tuck my tail or something like that. I pulled out a gun and 
all of them scattered. And then what's the crazy thing is these supposed to be some gang bangers and tough and all this. They call the police on me. That's how it goes. If they can't beat you one way, they'll beat you another way. And they come to court and testify me. Did you, was shots let off or? No, 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 no. You shots. just pulled out. Yep, that's what Lonnie just saw. So the what, judge, what, what time did you get? Oh, and you probably, did you get a felony firearms too? No, I didn't. I didn't get it. Okay. They, they let me plead out to a third official and. Oh, you already like, had cases. Already had cases, yeah. Oh, you had the juvenile case. What did you have as an adult? Some drug possession? As, a, as an adult, I had um, uh, I an embezzlement case. I had a uh, assault case. Oh, so you was just out there trying to get to the bag any which way, and if somebody got in the way, they might get touched up. Yeah, I, I I had a real, real, real bad temper. Real bad temper. And it's, like it's the opportunities to get into trouble there in Detroit abound. It's not – it will present itself to you every day. It definitely. So, uh, so what did you, what, what was the time you pled out till? What, what sentence? One to four years. Oh, so you, you didn't get too bad of a sentence, but you ended up doing all, didn't you do all the time? Yeah, I did all the time. I okay. Did. So, so take us through the intake and, and, and going into prison and what you're thinking and all that. Oh, you didn't go to, did you go to Riverside or Jackson quarantine? Cause you were. It's all lit up, uh, Jackson now. So okay, because oh, they because they used to be Riverside. If you were under twenty five or something, you went to Riverside. It was some age, so there is no Riverside. Everyone goes to Jackson. Yep, yeah. If you're fifteen, sixteen, you want to Jackson. Don't even matter. Oh wow! So Jackson, um, before they remodeled it, it was the largest walled prison in the world. Actually, they had more. They had like three thousand behind the walls. Uh, one of the most infamous prisons in the country. They've remodeled it somewhat, but I'm sure it's still his old. Where they still have a lot of the old part up, right? Yeah, they do. You can see over there, and it's a little piece of the wall, so you can see over there. But it's Kadeel. okay. So you are it mostly what people are in now is the new, is new construction. Um, it's the same build. It just it's just not as bad as the other uh, parts. Oh, they it's refurbished it, but it's the same build. Yeah, same sliding bars, cranking. Yeah, you really it. feel like you're in jail. You're like, oh wow, I'm in jail. Oh uh, man, when I went there, all the uh, when I walked in the unit, all the noises, the animal noises, the oh, you might be my girlfriend. Hey, you the tall one. I'm gonna make you my. I'm like, damn, what did I get myself into? Yeah, that's what the 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 West Coast stuff with uh, with all the racial and the gangs is actually more. And you know, it seemed like to me it was easier. Like if you, if you know, followed the rules of your little group or something, you really you had people that wouldn't let people bother you, but. In Michigan, you pretty much, you're either on your own or you're going to see some people you know from the, your actual friends right. and get with them. So do, were you able, and unfortunately, like, you know, just going to Detroit public schools, even if your black was okay and your parents kept you in the house, you're going to see, like, oh, you're my best friend from fifth grade. I haven't seen you in a while. You're the kid that lived down the street, and they all in jail. The Did you, were you able to link up with some people you knew? It's a class reunion, but yeah, I, um, well, actually, I didn't know nobody in quarantine, but it was some GDs there. They asked me where I was from and then asked me all the stuff that you're supposed to ask the verified guy. And I linked up with those guys. So Michigan Prisons now has a strong, I get the sense from your channel and the stories you have on there, uh, strong gang uh, gang presence. Definitely. A lot of Midwest gangs uh, in, in the blood. They're being run by younger guys or? Well, Gangs like the Bloods are, but the Vice Lords and GDs, it's always an older guy usually in charge. They've been around a long time. Yeah. And um, what, what, when did you, your journey to uh, the Morris Science Temple? And we, you go to the same temple where uh, my friend uh, Fuquay Bay is the Grand Sheik. Shout out to Fuquay Bay and his mission to uplift fallen humanity, which is the Morris Science Temple of America's mission. Be a legend, yes. And, yes. and, and so what was your journey into that? Um, I was at a uh, Marquette level one. I was still gang banging, but a brother named Von Neal kind of planted a seed in my head. I had asked him, like, what's the difference between the nation of Islam and the Sunnis? And when he told it to me, I said, dang, it, it make a whole, whole lot of sense. And um, I eventually, you know, blow level one, get sent to a uh, level two. And um, there I started studying with the brothers and I joined maybe a year later. So you talk a lot about, and I want everyone to go to his channel. He interviews some some 
some interesting people and he has his own tremendous stories. He's a great storyteller and you'll get a, a good sense of uh, what Michigan prison and probably what a, probably Michigan is a little more indicative of how most prison systems are than in California, which is sure. kind of weird. Cal California is just weird in general. It's kind of a time warped. When you get here from somewhere else, you, you see people be like, damn, they're, Everyone's dressed like the people in Grand Theft Auto. And then you're like, oh, right. no, well, wait a second. They really did base San Andreas on, they really is really like that. Yeah. <laughs> so um, um, tell us, so so what's the more science temples kind of place in the, it's not a gang, it's a religion, but what's, but it's still a group of people banding together for protection within there in addition to the religious component. What's their place in the, the power dynamics of the prison system. I'm not just saying this because I'm a Moorish American, but I, I would say if we had a power ranking system, I think the Moors would be number one off simply organization and numbers. Yeah, and that's numbers. what I, I that's what my understanding would be. And um, but did, did a lot of guys. So whenever you're uh, the strongest group, because of course going to be weak people. Some oh, of the people joining are the weak people looking just for protection. Yes. And not really believing in, you know, what what the mission is was 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 that did did they try to ferret out that or that just would come come to the surface at some point anyways? It's always going to come to the surface. Usually it's always going to come to the surface. But the more is the type of people they are, even if you are weak, they're going to stand for you still. They just it's hard to get through to the woods with the Moorish Americans. It's hard. Well, that's that's good. So they they looked out for some of the young guys and all that. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, everybody, especially the older guys. No matter how what much, they um, how much, uh, how what percentage of the younger guys were in a gang or a religious group? Almost everybody. Um, usually the young guys don't do the religious groups; they do the gangs or the organ. What? Were would, most would, people in some type of organization? I would say uh, probably eighty-five percent to ninety percent. Oh, so almost everybody. Yeah, everybody belonged to somebody. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's kind of new in Michigan, too. So it wasn't neighborhoods and streets. We the Dexter guys. We're the North End guys. No, they don't do that. No, no, they don't do that. It's a group. Oh, that's how it used to be, yeah. So it's it's or groups. City. Okay, oh, yeah, right. Okay, so probably there's so many people from Detroit. They all separate. But, like, did the Flint guys all stick together? Oh yeah, definitely. All the Flint guys definitely, definitely stick together. The Pontiac guys, Inkster guys. But then they'd also be in their own separate. They might be blood. Were or were they weren't in the gang so much? Uh, it's it's fifty fifty. Some belong to a gang, but they're gonna come when they Flint guys need them, or they just strictly Flint or strictly Saginaw. So on the so it's more so most of Detroit. There was no Detroit identity because it's too many. It, or it, it depends. And yeah, in Marquette Branch Prison, that's the first time I seen a bunch of Detroit guys link up, and it was so many of them, and they kind of like even left their gangs just just to do that, so to you know maintain the peace. And um, you know what what were some of the first problems you had? So you went to a level one with only a one to four, so you could have been at the halfway house in six months. Well, the first flop that I got, it wasn't because I got. Oh, trouble. you got a flop. That's right. They do parole flops in Michigan. Yeah, yeah. They said I didn't have enough time in, in prison, so they flopped me before, oh. I, before I ever got in trouble. Before I ever got so in trouble. So how many months had you had in when you saw the parole board the first time? I was in prison probably only like five months. Oh, okay. They wanted you to do some time. So you get flopped. Were, were you disappointed or did you expect that? They they were already telling me that that's probably going to happen to me. People was honest with me like, hey, you ain't got enough time in. You ain't completing none of your classes. You're probably going to get flopped. But they might call you back early. So, I, But I was mad, though. I was mad. So what what was your first uh you know serious trouble that started to cause you to stay in there a long time? The first trouble I got caught for, I had uh jumped in one of the GD's fights and it was the dumb it was over the dumbest stuff I thought I learned. So over a, a meatball tray and a cookie. So Hey, food is food is like gold in there. <laughs> it is. And um I had jumped in it, he got beat up real bad and um the rules they taught me, the older guys, say, like, you know, when you're living in an open environment with a bunch of bunks and stuff like that, if you get into it with a guy, you do something to him too bad. You can't let him stay because you got to sleep around. Him. So oh. in my head, 
I don't want to get hit with no hot water while I'm asleep, no, no uh, boiling baby oil. So I told him he had to leave. He wouldn't leave. And I ended up stabbing the guy. And so uh, uh, you have a great story. Well, it's not great, but a, a compelling story on your YouTube specifically about some guys and bo uh, boiling up oil and water in a, in a coffee pot and disfiguring each other's faces. So go over to his channel. And, and that's 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 one of the stories that I was like, man, that's that's scary. Yeah, you got to go to sleep with someone you beat up. Lock in a sock, all that. Yeah, he could have woke me up to all that. He could have. Um, so so you what did they move you to a higher security level after that? Yeah, Mar Mar at Marquette Branch level one. If you if you uh blow level one, they send you to level five until you can find a level two to be housed with other people. Oh, level five's horrible, right? Oh man. It's a it's a it's a it's more of a mental institution than a, a prison. Was that level five in Marquette or somewhere else? Uh, Love Five Marquette. Yep, I is Marquette there. still that real old structure, or are they refurbished that too? Oh, it looked real old. It looked like an old castle, an old dungeon. Castle. Yeah, Marquette used to always be like the punishment. So when Michigan prisons were first built, those were the two they built: Jackson Prison for Southern Michigan, Marquette for Northern. And there's even that you know you've heard that that slang term, "Don't Marquette me." So it was <laughs> like you've heard that, right? Yeah, that was like. That was like Marquette. So like, don't look at me like we're in Marquette with like murder in your eyes. Like that was the reputation Marquette had. Right. My friend told me he was in Marquette and he went in the shower and they had a guy and they were doing what they do to him. And they had a, a, a picture from like a hustler magazine pinned to his back so they could look at it while they were. Yeah. That was like oh. one of the worst things I ever heard. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, look, I can believe it. Trust me. Them guys. Did you what what um type of pr predator activity did you see go on? Like if 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 you weren't in a group, or even if you were in a group, what what type of predator activity was going on? Sounds like I, there's a fair amount of sex activity in there. Yeah. So, you know, uh, white suburban men who not really from that cloth, um, sex offenders when they come in, th those are the guys that's usually targeted. But I seen guys go get a man and a whole lot of debt, brawling them stuff, brawling them stuff to the point he couldn't pay it back. And then, you know, they over there talking out publicly in front of everybody like, hey, you're going to do these sexual acts, so on and so forth, and start sharing one guy saying, I say, man, this is a cold game. This is a cold game. I would have to uh, honestly say I would I would go ahead and PC up before I paid, paid my debt with my... <laughs> yeah, for sure. When I, when I was seeing it going on, I wanted to, I told one of my brother men, I wanted to say something about it, but they got on me and told me, mind my business. They told me all the reasons why you do that. We're not about to go to war with nobody over how they jail. And I'm like, damn, yeah, that stuck with me for a long time. Cause I kind of, and bad. you know, guys will get into, to, to be in jail where you can't, there's no pawn shop to go get no money. Like if I owe you, I might literally not be able to pay you. So Anyone that has such a bad sense of what their behavior should be that they get into an unpayable debt in jail, I mean, you can see bad things happen to them and feel sorry for them, but if you get them out of it, they probably just going to get themselves in it again. Yeah, definitely. Uh, especially if you're a fish. A lot of fish take a, a stuff from people, and they won't double back, or they, you know, they got bad intentions behind loaning you all this stuff. Was there so a lot of people are, are, are you know, because again, all this California stuff that everything's racial and all that. Uh, not I was obviously people that weren't from the streets, which is going to be white suburbanites. But other than that, I mean, it wasn't. But a black suburbanite, too, is not going to be used to that environment. The racial dynamics were a little different in there. Right. Then mm -hmm. then we might know from California. Yeah, I see in California, like uh, I, was, I keep hearing the stories where a black man and a white man can't eat together or a Mexican or a white, but that's not there. If you said that to somebody, you, you might get into it with them for sure. Every, you know, a, a lot of white kids belong to black gangs, GDs, vice lords. They take them. Cause they might've grew up. They might've been, they were probably, they must've been in it on the streets. Yeah. Yeah. Or get, got recruited cause they might be a little bit tough. So that, that, that definitely brings you in. They definitely always looking to bring somebody in. It's kind of tough. Uh, what about like how much uh, uh, did it vary like drug availability by what institution you were at? Yeah, yeah, it did. Uh, I was at Ken Ross and they had so much. And that's out in the country. That's like up north and probably yeah. there's 
they can hide stuff out in the woods and stuff. Yeah, people just throw stuff over the fence. Sometimes it was it was a lot. It was a lot of marijuana there, a lot of some boxing. Um, but right right across the street at Chippewa, where I went, there was barely any drugs there. Was that more of a secure? Definitely, yeah. It's ran like a level three still. Okay. And then a lot of it depends on how crooked the guards at a particular place are. Because yeah. that's, that's where cell phones is coming from and big amounts of drugs. Yeah. Guy like, told me he used to keep a pound of weed in a cell at Jackson. I could, uh, yeah, I can believe that. That's yeah. not yeah. getting brought in and swallowed in a balloon, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um. Did did What about, um like, uh, politicists? Politicists? <laughs> the inmates uh, banding together in like a political manner against the uh, administration or the, I noticed in the West coast, you know, the gangs are convenient or the racial stuff, especially is convenient for the administration to keep the inmates at each other. Because if the inmates come together, well, that's a whole nother problem. Yeah. I, I only seen that twice. Uh, one time being a Chippewa, uh, all the gang members, um, the heads of the organizations that came together and said, if any of yours go to lunch today, because, uh, you know, they get paid per, when you swipe your car in the uh, lunch line, they get paid. So they went to everybody and say, look, if, if, if you belong to this group, you belong to that group. If you go to lunch, you're going to get violated. You're going to get beat. And that's how they, um, I guess, picketed the, the cafeteria because the food. Yeah, because they, they, they privatized the food at one point, yeah. right? And the calories was like 2,300 calories or something. And it was so nasty, man. I'm talking about season, don't even fix it. Like, if you didn't have no conversation for it, like a, quite a period of time, you probably would have been starving. And were you in the system when the Melanics, like, didn't they like destroy, uh, was it Ken Ross or Chippewa? Yeah. It was Ken Ross in 99, but no, I wasn't, I wasn't there. Okay, I, that I, was before your time, but you heard about that. Definitely, yeah. They, the Melanics told me the stories about it. Were there many? Didn't they use that as a way to kind of break up the Melanics, or are they still? The Melanics were once a, um, a charter group. They had their own religious service, but they took that away. That's dead. Nah, they still oh, have okay. Yeah. They got and the Melanics guys. have Nat Turner as their um, prophet. <laughs> yeah, okay. So do are they still, are there many of them left, or? Um. Not, not really. Maybe the most I seen was probably fifteen on the yard, but they click up with the GD, so uh, they still act. They still militant. Oh, the Melanics. I mean, what's what's the connect? Is it just uh, just personal relationship? Like, what's the connection between the GDs and the Melanics? The six point star. Oh, okay. Yeah. And now I'm interested in a phenomenon. You know, I'm out here in California, and I just happen to have a certain set of friends here, and I was thinking about how the whole blood identity through rap music has become like this weird phenomenon of just like a default like oh i'm gonna be a blood like because you just hear about it in rap music but so was that the single biggest group in there that was the biggest gang they weren't that organized though or it it's it's so many of them they own they, like the crips out in california they just beef with each other that's they they did their own biggest enemy no oh. and they're mostly younger yeah, all really all guys thirty two and under. Yeah. How many like uh bikers or like like that white bikers were in there? Uh probably one or two here and there. Oh, they weren't enough to be in groups. No, no. The bikers probably just gravitate towards the, the oldness and dirty white boys. Okay, how much yeah, what what was the white um like whites only? Like how much of that was there? Uh, not not very much. They didn't have too many numbers, but they were everywhere though. Existed it existed small groups. A bunch of sex link up. Yep. And did they they probably didn't really have much general power other than defending themselves. Exactly. They always got the worst hands. They got the worst seats, the worst phones. They had So the, why go yeah. participate in that? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know why you would Was that mostly guys probably from like rural areas or Exactly, all up north guys, you know, or or very very older guys. Back when it was segregated, they probably still believe in that. But all of them was from Howe and Chip Ken Ross. They they weren't from the city or nothing like that. 
you cross paths with any, or I'm sure you did, any like uh, famous kind of names, get whether gangsters or just famous crimes? Uh, the brother, Lil Larry, he's a uh, Moorish American, but that's who killed uh, Blade Icewood. And he's got tombstones with all his victims' names on his back, right? Yes, he does. And um, I, that's I heard spooky. About it. Yeah, and I seen him in the bathroom, so I go look at it because I heard about it. And he, he had the brother name. Go watch, go watch his story on that. He's got it for you, Detroit people. Little Larry was convicted of taking Blade Icewood's life. He has uh, several tombstones with darnell Lindsay and other names on it and you had a little run in with him so go watch that story on his his channel as well um what, what was um an uh uh what was like uh the most uncomfortable or fearful position you ever got in probably the most fearful moment was uh i was walking up to a the day room which is a big glass room with a door on it whatever they got the microwaves and the car tables and uh as i was walking up a Moorish American start beating up this blood guy. And um, the police tell me, hey, go go get in the room. They come lock the door. And when I'm in, I, I walk in there, I turn around, the whole day room was full of bloods and a few cops and vice lords, they all had a, they was all clicked up and they was just looking at me crazy. But luckily my homie, SB Spade was in there and he told him I was cool and I wasn't- Seven miles, seven mile bloods. Yeah, seven mile blood, 55, yeah, them boys. And uh, yeah, he saved me that day because they was on me. And uh, I see him pass knives and all that, put him back up after he said I was cool. I'm like, God, thank you. Um, an interesting guy you talk a lot about and I had heard of, uh, our, our Ricky Remmer. Um, he's been down since the 70s. He's one of the leading Moorish guys. Like, what? what's his what's his fame or what? You interacted with him, right? Yeah, a whole lot. He taught me a whole lot. Um, yeah, he... Yeah, he definitely prison famous, infamous. Everybody respect him. He put a lot of work in, caused some murder cases in prison, then beat him. So you know that that aura to come from that. Oh, he beat the cases they gave him in prison. Yeah, but he's been in since the late seventies, right? Yep, yep, since the late seventies. It's it's a, it's it's a surprising number of guys that have been down. Like I had a chance to interview, but I didn't do it. Uh, World Kincaid, Benji. I'm sure, you heard of him? I just he talked was, to him. Oh, really? Okay. Yep. Did they give him, did they reinstitute his life? He said he should be home soon. Um, oh, he is going to get back out. That's what he said, yeah. That's what he said. Uh, I'll be talking to his brother tomorrow or whatnot but, and find out the details. But that's definitely an interesting story, too. He His name run through there just as much as uh, Ricky Rimmer. Yeah, and, you know, the 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 legend is that he he – called the hit on Demetrius Holloway from prison. Yeah. But you know, that's just street innuendo. He was never charged. But even if he was falsely accused of that, that just shows the level of uh, fame and influence that people could even make that lie up and it was even believable. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> the story um, and so how'd you so so you just kept getting in trouble and that's how you stayed that you did the full four? did the full four years no parole no parole came home no parole that was a good how thing. long you been on for three years now oh good for you so so what have you been doing in that time i've been working i mean i, I got in a little, little back into life a little bit but i left it alone completely now uh that was what two years ago and i just been working stacking up and hopefully do some big things this summer i'm about to invest in some real estate and whatnot now i just miss middleman and paint sales and uh you know, flipping used cars. And is your 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 YouTube's monetized? It's back monetized. It was suspended for a while, but it's back monetized. What now. got it suspended? I had used my own videos from TikTok, and they said it was reused. Oh yeah, yeah. Be careful with that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I well, it's just seeing the TikTok, but how would it know it's you? It's seeing the TikTok signs. Okay. So the AI is just is just finding that. Mm -hmm. So now, what I want you to do. Google um, or YouTube search uh, YouTube thumbnails because your thumbnail, if you up your thumbnail game, that could double your views and money or triple. The thumbnails are super duper important. Okay. How, how good are you at using your analytics to like know what's going on on your channel? I don't think I'm good at it at all. I was just thinking about that. Like I got to do a lot more research. Well, I we'll 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 do a private call. I'll uh, I'll uh, give you, give you some tips tips and tricks. But start off with uh, 
your look at the click through rate of all your stuff. It should all be 4% or above. And, 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 and there's people that'll tell you like, what are the effective ways to make thumbnails? They're mostly using close ups of faces. Um, and you know, you, you, you'll, you'll read about it. And, uh, that, that alone could double, triple your money just with your existing content. Okay. I'm definitely on it. So I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want to burn through your story because I want him to go to your channel because you got great stuff on there. So I'm going to put the link to his channel down there. Don't forget to get your vanity name and we're going to talk. Uh, I'll give you a call soon and I'll give you some tips and tricks and thanks for coming on and go watch this guy's channel. It's a, uh, it's a unique thing. Even in the prison world, he's a great storyteller. He does not overly rah rye. He tells you when he was scared or nervous, he go, you know, he doesn't, um, uh, pick side, you know, like if even his own group, if he wants to make a critique, he, he did. And he's just honest about his experiences and, uh, a powerful, a powerful channel. So thanks for doing what you do. And, and, and we'll talk soon and go, go subscribe to his channel and watch those commercials. I appreciate you, big brother. Surreal. I'll mess with you. Dig. Salute you. I'll I see you when I'm in Detroit next time. Okay, Islam, big five. I got you. Thanks.